Hello everyone, this is Mr. Reardon and I'm going to be walking you through some important information you need to know about life in Elizabethan England. Uh, now, William Shakespeare lived during, uh, during the reign of Elizabeth I. Most of his life overlaps with her reign and so I think having a good sense of what life was like during the time of Elizabeth I will give you also a really good sense of the world in which Shakespeare would have lived and written our play, which will be Romeo and Juliet. So who was Elizabeth I? Um, she was Queen of England from 1558 to 1603. So this is the height of the English Renaissance. She was on the throne for 45 years, which was a very long time for a ruler to be on the throne during that period. And you'll find out why later in this presentation. Um, she was known as being uh, particularly well-educated, especially for a woman of the era. Um, she was very wise. She was seen as fair. She wasn't necessarily like uh, a super gentle ruler. You know, if you ended up, uh, you know, breaking her rules, she would she could uh, punish you very f uh, ferociously. Um, but she, on the whole, was, um, by the end of her reign, was uh, both loved and feared by the people of England. Um, she never married, and so you will occasionally see her referred to as the Virgin Queen, um, and that it's just really a reference to the fact that she never um, had a husband. There was never a king of England at the time that she was queen. Um, now again, I want to clarify the alignment with her life and Shakespeare's life. Um, so Shakespeare was born in 1564. Um, if you look up here, you can see that um, Elizabeth I took the throne in 1558. That means uh, Shakespeare was born just six years later, um, and most of his life overlaps with the Queen's rule. Um, Romeo and Juliet was published in 1597, so near the end of Queen Elizabeth's time on the throne. And uh, Shakespeare actually died in 1616, but Queen Elizabeth I died in 1603. So actually the later part of Shakespeare's life and during his uh, production of many of his plays, his later plays, was actually under a different king. That's James II of England, um, James VI of Scotland. Um, so you'll hear references to like the King's Men as a group of uh, theater, a group of, uh, um, you know, producers of plays that uh, that worked, that Shakespeare worked with, that Shakespeare was uh, largely uh, in charge of. And those were, um, that was a group playing for James II. It was a little bit after um, the rule of Elizabeth I. Um, so I think the first place to start is just with the a class structure of Elizabethan England. I think it will help you to understand some of the other things we discuss coming up pretty soon. So the population consisted of 5% nobility, um, gentry, and clergy. Those were the people who were who had a lot of money, who were the most wealthy. Maybe they had inherited landed titles through many, many generations, going all the way back to the Norman Conquest, and even before that in some cases. Um, there were also people who were, they had a lot of land, even if they weren't technically noble. And so they would, um, and of course, land was extremely valuable back then for a lot of reasons. And so if you had a lot of land, you could, you uh, could sell little bits of that land and then you would have money. And so we had the landed gentry, even if they didn't fall under the, the category of um, inherited uh, you know, nobility inherited through the generations. There was also the clergy, and that's just a word that captures all the people who work for the church. At this time, it was people working for the Church of England, um, and uh, before the Elizabethan times, before actually the reign of King Henry VIII and the Protestant, uh, the Protestant Reformation in England, where, you know, the king essentially said, hey, the church here is no longer going to be Catholic church. We're going to do our own church thing here. Um, like that happened several centuries before this. And uh, before that point, the clergy would have been Catholic. And the Anglican church really was just, was uh, very much like the Catholic church with only a few key differences in terms of how things ran. So 5% nobility, gentry, and clergy, 85% middle class, 
and 10% beggars, vagabonds, and the very poor. Um, so the, the poorest people um, would have lived in what today we would consider abject poverty, like uh, extreme, extreme uh, filth and uh, just barely making a living through, uh, through begging and through getting, uh, through like just uh, getting alms, right? Getting uh, maybe help from the church and getting help from wherever they could, you know, getting little bits of food here and there, that kind of thing. Um, so you'll notice here that, you know, often when we think of uh, times, you know, several hundred years ago, we often think of this, you know, tiny, rich class at the top and then everyone else being really quite poor. And that is not at all actually how it was in Elizabeth's England. And you had this very big middle class. Um, of course, just like today, the middle class does range from the lower middle class to the upper middle class, almost wealthy. Um, and that was true. But this middle class overall was able to um, live, er, get to a standard of living that the the other ten percent down at the bottom just were not able to. Um, so this class included many craftspeople. Um, it included farmers and laborers who would have been on the lower end of that middle class group, um, and it also included, um, you know, particularly uh, successful craftspeople, people who were part of guilds. Um, we're talking about weavers, brewers, carpenters. Um, shipwrights, so people who built ships, um, tailors, shoemakers, masons, butchers, fishers, like fishermen, merchants, blacksmiths, all of these groups of people would have been comfortably in the middle class, depending on where you were and how good you were at your work and how many other people um, of your profession were in the area that could determine your overall quality of life and whether you fall, uh, where you fall in that middle class uh, grouping. Um, whether the top or the bottom or somewhere in the middle. Um, also, I'll mention here that this class of people was, um, because it contained, it was so big and contained so many uh, people of specific professions, and your profession really uh, was became so much of your life and so much of your identity in this world, um, they actually became what today we would call occupational surnames. And so if you, there's a reason why Smith is one of the most common, I think it might still be the most common last name in the English speaking world. It's because these occupations, especially being a, a goldsmith, silversmith, or blacksmith, blacksmiths working with iron, um, that would have been a particularly uh, productive and uh, lucrative, though definitely hard uh, job at the time would have allowed someone to support a family, to have kids, and their kids would have kids, and you end up with uh, a lot of people who have that name. Um, and that's, if you think about it, right, then the last name Shoemaker, the last name Taylor, the last name Brewer, or the female version Brewster, um, Weaver, uh, Fisher, all of these are uh, names that we still see in our world today. Uh, so, as for housing, um, housing, of course, would have depended on which of those three general class categories one fell into. Um, so the nobility or gentry would have likely lived in a large estate house if they lived out in the country, or maybe even a castle. Um, there were over a thousand castles in England at the time of various ages and conditions. And so someone with a lot of money, with a lot of land, may have been able to afford that. Um, if someone was had a lot of money, they might have also lived in a spacious dwelling in the city. Um, so it obviously wouldn't be quite as big as what you see over here. You know, this would be more of a country house, a country estate, um, but still having much more space um, and a, a much more comfortable standard of living in the city than most other people would have. Also, many people had both, right? So in the, uh, in the, uh, warmest part of the year, um, and uh, someone might go out to their uh, country estate and enjoy, you know, the the joys of living out in nature and not being in such a, um, a crowded city. And then maybe in the winter time, people would come back to their uh, their um, city dwellings. Um, so, as for middle class housing, um, actually, I'll mention the poor, the housing of the poorer people first. Um, so. 
the poorest people would have lived in overcrowded, uh, leaky, poorly built, dirty, multi-story buildings. Um, it would often be many people, you know, six, eight, ten people, entire families, multiple families you know, crammed into a single room. Um, this would typically be in one part of town. Um, it would be uh, so just, again, like abject poverty, something that we can hardly imagine in our world today. Um, so, and then people in the middle class would have had housing of quality somewhere in the middle, right? It wouldn't be this. It also wouldn't be, you know, crowded inner city housing, you know, with eight people to a room. Um, I actually think this house is a pretty good example here. This one down in the lower right-hand corner of a house that someone might live in uh, if they were like upper middle class. Um, this house actually is the house that Shakespeare would have been born in. Um, Shakespeare would have grown up in this house. When his parents died, he would have inherited this house and he did inherit this house. Um, so it's still standing, it's still there. Um, it's possible to go see it in uh, Stratford-upon-Avon today. Now, it's important to note, even if you lived in a house like this up here, um, or this house, or you were living, living in poverty, you did not have indoor plumbing. That wasn't really a thing yet in Shakespeare's time. Um, if it, and so if you had to, you know, do your business, you would have had to go outside. Um, typically during the day, you would go outside and there would be a public bathroom or there would be a, uh, like a, an outdoor public toilet, those would usually be set in a building kind of on or near a bridge. And so you would literally just go, you would sit on this long wooden platform that had holes in it and you would, you know, do what you needed to do. And then um, you would, and it would just kind of fall right through the hole and down into um, a moving stream or the river. Now people late at night generally would not do that. It was cold. It was probably could have been raining. Um, and of course, it might not have been safe for just anyone, especially women, um, to just go walking around uh, randomly like that at night. And so people had, people used chamber pots. And you can see an example of a, a chamber pot here. And this one is made of metal. Um, uh, often they would not have been made of metal in Shakespeare's time. They would have been made of other things, um, probably wood or porcelain. Um, but they, I think it's pretty representative. Um, they might have actually been, they, or they might have also been set inside a wooden box. Today we call those thunder boxes, and you can, uh, you know, imagine why it might be called that. It's called that for a reason. Um, and then the, you know, the, so you could, you know, have the, the chamber pot inside the box and then shut the lid on the thunder box. And so you didn't have to kind of look at or smell what was inside until the morning. Um, and then, you know, in the morning, uh, the waste would be removed. Um, so uh, some notes on hygiene in Shakespeare's time. Uh, the now, it's important to note that people rarely took baths, and this was true throughout the medieval and Renaissance times. Um, the, in fact, uh, Queen Elizabeth herself recommended bathing once a year. Um, she made that recommendation because it was believed that bathing would make you ill. Um, and honestly, that made some sense. Um, you might have, uh, when I mentioned the the chamber pots on the previous slide, um, you might wonder where or how they would empty the chamber pots. And often they would do so, I mean, sometimes they would do so in a river or stream, but if there wasn't one nearby, people would often just toss the waste. Um, you can kind of see it right here. You can see the liquid and the solids right there coming out of the chamber pot. They would just take it and toss it out the window onto the streets and people would run away. Um, the, the, the famous phrase was Gardalou, which um, was a, a French, kind of inherited from French meaning, uh, be, because of course, uh, Lou became, came from the French word l'eau, meaning water. Um, so uh, if, if you think about it, uh, there's all these contaminants all over the street. Um, the, uh, you've had, not only did you have human waste, but you also had animal waste, right? I mean, cats and dogs peeing and pooping everywhere. Um, you had horses, right, which were a major form, force of, um, uh, excuse me, a major form of transportation. They, um, 
you know, do what they do on the streets. I mean, you had rotting food, you had dead cats and dogs and rats, you had um, just the general dirt from the ground. It was, it was truly nasty, right? Nasty beyond anything we can comprehend. And oh my goodness, the smell, right? So if you take those facts and you kind of put them together with, um, with this idea of bathing, like it actually kind of made sense. If you go cover yourself in this dirty, you know, poop filled, contaminated river, then you, you, now you're covering yourself with all of that gross stuff. And if you happen to have a cut or, uh, you know, an injury or something, and then bacteria could get in there and there were no antibiotics. So then you died, right? It actually made sense why they would feel that way. Um, Speaking of bacteria, um, disease was a, uh, was a fact of everyday life in Elizabethan England. Um, of course, we, there was still the bubonic plague. Um, the, bubonic, the bubonic plague was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Of course, they didn't know that, but we know that today. Um, it was spread from person to person. Um, it could also be uh, spread through the bites of infected fleas and lice. Um, in the last few years, there has been some research to suggest that rats were not actually as involved as they as we initially thought they were. Um, but that is also a common belief that the rats carried the fleas, and then the fleas bit the rats, and then the fleas bit, bit the people, and that's how the people got it. Um, it's not exactly super clear exactly what the uh, what the transmission looked like, but we knew that. Uh, there were a few different kinds of it. Um, if you got the really bad kind, that is the septicemic plague, septicemia being like an infection of the blood, then you had a 99 to 100% chance of dying, right? So almost everyone who got infected died. There were a couple other kinds, um, the pneumonic version, so you got it in your lungs, and the rate of mortality for that was a little lower, like 70%. Um, so if you think, if you want to think about this in our modern, you know, 2023 terms, it was, it was, it's considerably more likely that someone would die of COVID-19 in our world today, which is not a high rate at all, right? Um, than it was to live through an infection of the uh, septicemic plague. So pretty scary. Um, now, and that's, and that of course is on top of everything else, right? They had influenza, they had colds, they had dysentery from contaminated food and water. They had tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid fever, typhus, malaria, syphilis. Um, and I could go on and on. There were so many diseases that just people had to deal with. Um, the, it, it would be, um, a rare thing for someone to live a full life in Elizabethan England and not get half of these at least once. Um. So the, in particular, I'll mention dysentery. Dysentery is a special word that just means uh, um, large quantities of liquidy, sometimes bloody diarrhea that would come from uh, accidentally eating somebody else's uh, um, waste and, uh, you know, because through contaminated food or water. Um, and it would often, if someone didn't, uh, you know, get, uh, clean water to drink and have proper care, it would be lethal, especially for young people. Um, so that actually connects nicely to our next topic here, which is life expectancy, um, especially uh, because of issues like dysentery and all these other diseases. Um, one in 20 children would die within one week of their birth. So that's 5% of births, you know, 5% of the population right off the top, done. Um, two in five children, that's 40% of children, um, died before they reached age 15. Um, and that actually comes real close to, uh, our friend Shakespeare, um, our friend Shakespeare's, uh, son Hamnet died at age 11. Um, it was likely that he died from the plague, but we aren't certain of that. Um, all that we know is that he died at age 11. Um, Shakespeare wrote a play called Hamlet with an L instead of an N in that fourth position of the name. Um, and uh, we, there is some thought that maybe there's a connection between Hamnet and Hamlet. I mean, they only are one letter apart, right? So the also one in a hundred women died in childbirth. And that is a lot more than in our world today. The 
the rate was more like one in 50 among the poorest people, among that poorest 10% that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, also, the overall average age of death was 40 years, 40 years. Um, so, and that's extremely low. And of course, that average is being held down by some of these other statistics, like how many children died before they reached 15 and how many babies died, you know, within one week of their birth. Um, it's also true, though, uh, and it's important to be clear about this fact that if you made it to age 20 and you didn't give birth, um, you didn't plant, didn't give, or excuse me, you made it to age 20 and you didn't give birth at all, like over the course of your life, your chances of making it to 60 were similar to today's world. Um, and so if you made it to 20, you know, you probably had some immunity to many of the diseases that were discussed and you uh, would, making it to 60 was um, uh, not necessarily unheard of if you made it to 20. All right. Um, shifting gears a little bit here, now that we have a good sense of like the, the big picture, what life was like, um, we can think about, uh, think a little bit about education and uh, culture in Elizabethan England. Um, so there was no required education and certainly no public education paid for by the government. Um, so all formal education cost money. Um, so uh, that was uh, not accessible to everyone for sure. Formal education was mostly reserved for boys. Um, girls were generally offered a domestic education. So um, if you were a if you were a girl um, and you were wealthy or middle class, you would be expected to you know live a domestic life in your in your adulthood. So the primary, uh, you know, primary purpose, primary goal of a woman would be to to raise children and keep a house. And so their education starting, you know, around ages seven or eight would be to, you know, to learn how to cook, to learn how to keep a house, to learn how to run a household, manage servants, etc. Um, and that would be the, the majority of the education. Um, girls would sometimes learn how to re uh, read and write at a level, you know, uh, appropriate for domestic life and also um, so that they could read and appreciate the Bible because that was definitely seen as important in this time. Um, but beyond that, in a more formal education was reserved for, um, was reserved for boys. Um, the wealthiest people, you know, we're talking that top 5%, um, would often have live-in tutors to prepare children for a uh, university um, and also to prepare them for managing the inheritance that they would um, inevitably receive. Um, they, uh, there would also be governesses in some cases, especially for young girls. Um, so a, a wealthy woman would not have to, you know, take on the full responsibility of raising and educating uh, her female children. She would sometimes play a part, but not a big part. Um, and so there would be a governess or sometimes they used, they had the word nurse as well. And you'll actually meet a nurse in Romeo and Juliet. I um, mean, that's like a woman, a, a middle class or lower class woman whose uh, role it is to, to physically nurse and also to uh, sort of take care of and raise and educate a, uh, a young girl with help, of course, from some more educated people. Um, so you had, um, now middle class people, middle class boys would start around age seven, they would go to what was called petty school. Um, and there they would just learn the basics of reading and writing in English. Um, and maybe a little bit of numeracy, a little bit of counting, but not a ton. Um, and if they did well there, they would then go on to grammar school. Keep in mind, this was, this did have to be paid for. Um, it wasn't super expensive, but it was definitely out of reach of the, um, the laboring classes, or the laboring, you know, the lower middle class and the, uh, and the poor um, class. So um, they would go to grammar school and the focus of grammar school was not English grammar, but Latin grammar. And that's kind of why it's called that. Um, they would learn Latin. Um, and they would learn Latin better than even the most educated uh, experts in Latin today, in our in universities today. They would be able to speak Latin fluently, essentially, and read and write in it fluently. And they would study the classics in their original, uh, either in their original languages, in some cases Greek, so they would learn some Greek as well, or they would read translations of uh, writers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, 
um, re more recent writers like Erasmus, um, and uh, of course they would read the Bible, including the Bible in its original Vulgate Latin form. Um, so they would leave school with this really robust understanding of the ancient world, especially the mythology of the ancient world, um, and so and the scholarship of the ancient world. And we'll see a lot of that in Romeo and Juliet, in all and in all of Shakespeare's plays. Now, the poorest people they might learn to count, they might learn basic numeracy, you know, in order to conduct uh, conduct business as needed, but they might never become literate. All right, our next slide here has to do with love and marriage. Um, so um, among the wealthy, marriage was undertaken for convenience. Um, it was often done for political or monetary gain, and it was done, um, it was important because it helped the society to control who inherited what, right? If a, you know, a man gives birth to a daughter, um, and doesn't have any sons, it's important to him that he knows, it's going to be important to him that he knows where his money's going when he dies, right? When he and his wife die, then, you know, their money's going to go somewhere. Inevitably, it's going to go into the hands and the pockets of the, you know, man that his daughter marries. Um, with multiple daughters it's and, and sons, it gets more complicated, but I think you get the idea. Um, so it was very much in the in a father in a father's best interest to um, choose an appropriate husband for his daughters. Um, wealthier men and women had, uh, for that reason, had very little choice as to who they would marry. Um, a marriage of a young man and woman would be arranged by their parents, especially the fathers. The mother would have some say, especially when it came to daughters, but not a lot. Um, and often there was little. Uh, consideration of the children's wishes. Um, it was, though, uh, important to note that uh, it was by the Elizabethan era, it would have been seen as, uh, like, not okay um, to force a son or daughter to marry someone. Like, if a man or woman strongly objected to their parents' proposed marriage partner, um, uh, like the, the partner that their parents chose for them, um, it would not have been okay to make them do it. Like that would have been frowned upon by, by the society. Um, so there is a little bit of flexibility there, but it was still mostly arranged. Now, this idea though of marriage for the purpose of love was starting to become more accepted in Shakespeare's time, especially among the, the lower classes. The idea of you know a person just deciding you know based on based on attraction and based on uh, uh, intellectual interest you know who it was that they wanted to marry was that was coming to coming to be a little bit it was a debate in the society at the time uh, and we'll actually see a little bit of that in Romeo and Juliet a little bit of that tension you know should a ma should a pa should parents decide who their children marry or should uh, marriage be decided by uh, you know, the people who are actually going to be making that degree of commitment. All right, so as I think you've seen here, right, life is not all rainbows and butterflies in Elizabethan England. Um, in the words of the famous philosopher at the time, Thomas Hobbes, life was nasty, brutish, and short for many, many people in this time. Um, so how did people manage, right? How did people deal with their difficult, stressful, constrained, and deeply uncertain lives? Um, that's the question we're going to be answering next. And they had three different ways of doing that, three major ways of doing that. Um, so they had, the, they had religion, um, they had superstition, and they had entertainment. And we're going to talk about these. Um, so... Religion was a big one. Um, of course, England at the time was very much a Christian country. Uh, belief in God, reading the Bible, going to church, and holding a deep, deep uh, and profound faith were central to life at the time, as were understandings of heaven and hell as potential future options for everyone. You can see over here um, on the right side this image. Um, this that does a really good job of capturing the Elizabethan worldview of like what of like the, just the, the way um, the the uh, entire universe was organized. Um, you had uh, 
you know, the heavens up here, you had God and Jesus Christ up here. And then um, you had uh, the angels. And then, you know, below them, you had the the clergy and er, the, excuse me, you had the clergy and you also had, um, you know, human beings. And then you had animals and then more animals. Right. And then uh, um, you had, oh, there's like fish here. Right. And ocean creatures um, and then plants on the bottom. Right. And then you had, you know, the 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 crust of the earth. And then people believed, of course, that you had down here, you had hell. Right. And so that's it. I think it does a really good job of capturing the way that Elizabethans looked at the world. Um, now, it's important to note there was still some uh, tension around Protestantism versus Catholicism at the time. It was only um, about a century earlier that uh, before Shakespeare lived that the, that the uh, England was trying to deal with its identity as a Protestant country or a Catholic country. And so. Um, there were some Catholics still in England, but it was officially Protestant. Um, Elizabeth I was Protestant, um, the, and the Anglican Church was very powerful. Um, there's evidence, though, that Shakespeare may have been raised Catholic, that his dad was Catholic. It's hard to tell you know, which church Shakespeare officially subscribed to, um, but it was um, there, that tension was going as well. Um, and belief in paradise, so heaven, right, in the next life, is really what kept people going through the difficulties of their earthly lives. That hope for, um, you know, if you if you struggle and live through the pain of your earthly life, that um, you will be rewarded by going to paradise in the next life. That was a motivating, uh, very much a motivating idea for people. There was also superstition. So people in Elizabethan England were Christian, but they believed in lots of superstitions. So um, they believed in witches, they believed in magic, they believed in you know mischievous fairies that would mess with you in your sleep or that would uh, just generally try to wreak havoc, um, that would steal objects from you and hide them, um, things like that. Um, they believed in the supernatural, you know, ghosts, spirits, etc. They had very much belief in luck Right, it was um, you know terrible luck to walk under a ladder because it looked, it looked like the gallows um, where someone would be hanged. Um, it was uh, really bad luck to uh, stir a pot um, counterclockwise because it could make the because the food would make you sick. Things superstitions like that, and there are versions of those still with English speaking society today, like the latter one. Um, people also believed in astrology. Now, uh, astrology is fundamentally the idea that the positions of stars and planets at a specific moment in time um, could be, you know, captured and mapped out on a chart, and that that would be, that could predict a person's future, their fate, their destiny, right? So you can see here, for example, the, um, the natal chart of uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and uh, it like lists um, exactly when she was uh, when she was born and like the exact time she was born and the year and everything. Um, and you can see there's all these little symbols here that refer to um, different you know astrological things. Um, and uh, like I think this one here means it means Aquarius, right? So this is where Aquarius is on her chart. And there were people who considered themselves experts in this and would say things like, um, oh, her Aquarius is in this house over here and it means this about her future, right? They would say things like that. And most people in Elizabethan England believed in this. They believed that your destiny was written in the stars. They believed that you could uh, like compare your chart to someone else's chart and look at them together. And that would uh, help you to determine, for example, if you, if they would make a good marriage partner for you, if it would be, you know, a happy marriage or not. Um, so, and there are actually still people who do this, who believe in this and who practice this in our world today, but it was much more widespread and believed in, in Shakespeare's time. In Romeo and Juliet, you're going to see over and over again this idea of being star-crossed, star-crossed lovers. You know, um, you know your your star charts are at odds with each other. They're crossed. They're they're not meant to be. They're uh, an ill omen. They're ill fated. Those ideas are very much in Shakespeare. Pay attention in Romeo and Juliet for a celestial imagery 
um, discussions of the the stars and the planets and the sun and the moon and how they're connected to the fates of people. All right, our third way that Elizabethans were able to cope um, was through entertainment. Of course, they had sports, um, they had uh, archery, they had polo, which is not water polo. It's like uh, the kind played on horseback. And um, they had bowling, which is actually was actually an outdoor sport, kind of like a hybrid between modern bowling with pins and the modern games of like croquet and bocce ball. Um, they also had hawking and falconry. So people, especially wealthier people, would um, train and raise birds of prey and like use them for various things. People would hunt as well. Wealthier people would do that. Um, there were also uh, early forms of many uh, ball games played today, like soccer. Um, there were also indoor games for when the weather wasn't great. And that was a lot because it was England. Um, so card games that for adults often involved gambling, chess was invented by this point, people would play that. Um, there was also early board games, like uh, one called Game of Goose that involved dice and little squares on a board, um, not too different from our from the basic idea of our modern uh, board games. Um, you also had, um, you also had Music, um, of course, um, uh, just you know, more formal presentations of music, but also just music inside uh, taverns and places, gathering places. You had puppet shows, performances of all kinds from, uh, you know, jesters and, uh, and uh, musicians and uh, people who would just, you know, dress up in funny costumes and stand out on the street and entertain people. Um, this would be both indoors and outdoors. And of course, you have the theater. Um, people from all walks of life, from the poorest beggar to the queen herself, would come to the theater to see plays. Um, and what you see right here is actually a cross-section of the Globe Theater. Um, you'll learn a little more about the Globe Theater in one of your um, next videos. But the uh, essentially, this is where Shakespeare's plays would have been performed. Um, the wealthier people would have paid more um, and would have one of these higher seats, while the uh, the uh, the poorest people who came to see the plays would have paid just one penny, and they would have been groundlings, which means they would have uh, been crowded together here directly in front of the stage. No seats; they would have been standing, um, standing room only down there. Um, so that's a good idea. It gives you a good idea of what the theaters would have looked like. Um, so. We're reaching the end of our uh, slides here. Um, Elizabethan England um, represents a transition between, uh, a major transition period in England. Um, it represents a transition between older medieval cultures and the modern era. Um, it represents uh, the, uh, this, uh, a, a lot of opposites. Right, it rep it represents the uh, you know the clash of religion and superstition, um, of medievality and modernity, of tradition and novelty, of poverty and wealth, um, of solemnity in the face of death, and right dealing with death and disease, and also entertainment while in an effort to cope. Um, all of this is the world that Shakespeare spent his life steeped in from his earliest days through until his death. And you're going to see all of this, everything we've talked about, show up in various corners of his work. Um, for all these reasons, right, the, this was considered the height of the English Renaissance, um, and uh, it, the society only evolved from this point. Um, we had the technological innovation, the scientific development, and philosophical shifts that happened in the era of the Renaissance, and that ended up um, paving the way for the things that happened next. Um, you know, Shakespeare died in 1616. Um, by 1700, you had uh, colonies well established in what would become the United States. Um, their industrialization was underway. Um, the uh, many scientific concepts had been rediscovered um, from the classical era that um, hadn't been studied for a long time. Um, like all of this happened within a hundred years of Shakespeare's death. Um, and so he was living at the precipice. Um, and I think the, uh, what you've learned today um, will help, helps you to kind of see the, the, the crucial turning point that led him to 
produce what he did. All right, folks, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you.